It's so good to see you guys. My name is Randall. If I have not had the privilege of meeting you, welcome to Vertical Church. We love having new people here. Um, I am not the senior pastor, and as a sigh of relief fills the auditorium. Um, pastor Ken and Pastor Kathy are on vacation, enjoying, yeah, praise God, right? Um, you know, it gets real, guys. When it, I, Ryan is a senior this year, so he's going off to college. It gets real. You, you cherish those moments. They're clinging on to him like a, I don't know, a dryer sheet or something. Um, no, but, but they're having a, an amazing time, and I'm just so happy that I have the opportunity and the honor and privilege to be before you today in Pastor Ken's stead to present what God has placed on my heart. And sometimes it's difficult coming up here because, you know, some of you guys look angry, and then some of you sleep, and then I feel all insecure. I'm just kidding. Um, I yell a lot, so if you sleep, good on you. But today, I kind of just floated in here. I feel like I got a message on me today. I feel like I got a word, a simple word that's going to penetrate the hearts and minds of people that really need to understand what the truth is about Jesus Christ. So, hey, man, I'm excited. Um, here we are, you know, at the end of another year. Everybody have a good Christmas? Good Christmas, yeah? All right. Anybody eat a lot? I, I'm dieting. Uh, as of January 1st with a thousand other gym participants. Um, it's crazy that, you know, that I find myself in 2018 after my New Year's resolution was to lose weight even heavier. Can you imagine that? I don't know how it happened. It just snuck up on me. It snuck up on me. But I think that that's one of the reasons we like New Year's, right? We like, and today is New Year's Eve, which I'm still trying to get around Christmas being last week still. It's like going too fast for me. But, but so we, sometimes we look at like this opportunity starting a new year as an opportunity to examine ourselves, to look. You know, when I look down and can't see my toes, I know it's time um, to shave stuff off, to get rid of some stuff. Is this caught up in my beard? There we go. Um, and, and, and we look at that. So I'm excited about the new year. Um, one of the things that I, I was going to, I was going to tell you a little story and I'm, I'm trying to already judge my time because I want to get to the meat of this thing. Um, you know, we do make resolutions and we do set goals and what typically happens at least for me, I mean, I'm not accusing any of you diehard promise keepers, um, that around day nine or week two, I mean, I start off like a champion. I even go buy, you know, sports gear, nice new shoes. I look like, like the stereotypical, oh, that dude's not going to last five minutes, right? <laughs> new gym bag. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> going to be hard as a rock by the end of March. Nothing. Um, Week two, you know, I'm using that hour that I set aside for that to, to meditate upon the Lord, um, which means usually at, you know, one of the fast food places. Um, and it's disappointing. It's, it's like, it's, it's aggravating, right? It, it, I, I don't know why that is, but, but I think that once we get to past that first romance of today's going to be the day, or this week's going to be the week, or this year's going to be the year, we realize it's hard, it's hard to lose weight. It's hard to build this practice of exercising every day. It's hard to, to, to promise to, I'm going to read God's word every day. I'm going to journal this year. I'm going to journal every day this year. It's hard to work on our relationships. Relationships are difficult. And we find ourselves like, oh, you know, maybe I'll focus on this piece and not that piece. Quite frankly, being the people we want to be often feels like killing the person we are. The problem is so few of us know what it feels like to be free. And this is, this is something that is so exciting. This is something that's so transformational. This is something that, um, do you need me to grab that mic? Sorry, you just come right up, RJ. Let's clap it out for RJ and the sound team. You guys are awesome. That's it. We don't need to get fanatical. Relax. Relax, this is church. Um, <laughs> it's the beard. Kills them with the beard. <laughs> Why do I say stuff like that? Hey, listen, let's pray. 
Father God, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you that you are a God that meets us. And God, I don't want to limit you today by my expectation. I don't want to limit you today by the expectation of the people seated here. But Father God, I want you to blow us away. Holy Spirit, I want to encounter you in a way that I've never encountered you. I want to, I want to, be, I want to be filled with you. And I want you to take hold of this service and my words and my, and my tongue, Father God. I want you to redirect my mind. And I need you, Jesus. I need you, Holy Spirit, so that I convey what is on your heart this morning. And God, the moment I make it about me, forgive me and put me on task. And let it be all about you. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. And everybody says, amen. amen. Come on. So you're ready to be free this morning. Are you ready to leave 2017 in the past? I mean, just not even just 2017, but all the days before it in the past. <laughs> Do you believe that God is a God who dreams big dreams for your future, for your today, for your tomorrow? Come on. Are you excited about the God who calls us into this relationship? Not only this relationship, but this adventure of walking out grace in him. And knowing that we're equipped to do all that he's called us to do. And all he's called us to do isn't necessarily just sitting. Because we do a lot of that sometimes. We get weary. But God is not a God of, of, of being weary. God isn't a God of, of, of a Jesus who, who, who we just pull out every once in a while. A small Jesus, a, a Bible school Jesus. I mean, a, you know, a Sunday school Jesus. Bible school Jesuses are bigger. It's just the transition. But he's not the Jesus we just pull out like on Sundays or a Wednesday night experience or in times of tumultuous grief or pain. He's a God that wildly pursues us, who longs for us, who's desirous of us and of our attention, who, who calls us his plan A, who, who considers us worthy of this, of this task that he's given us, this, this ordination that he's placed on us, this mantle as Christ's followers to go and love people with the same love that he has shown us. Guys, if you're ready to dive into the limitless embrace of God's grace this morning and this coming year, I need you to be alive with me. Just give God a little bit of shout this morning. Come on. Because God has a plan for you today. He doesn't want us to settle. Galatians 5.1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Ephesians 2.8.9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing. It's a gift from God. It's a gift from God. Not a result of work so that, so that no one, none of us can boast. Look at how good I am. Look at how God is using me. It's not about me. It's all about him. But when we make it about us, we get all confused. We get all wrapped up. We miss this great adventure that God pours out for us. I want to talk to you about Paul this morning, the artist formerly known as Saul. Many of you know him. He's the rock star of the New Testament. He writes about two-thirds of it. Some people give the estimation about two-thirds of the New Testament was written by Paul. This guy was a lightning rod, right? He was amazing. He, had a, he just had a fever for more cowbell. No. I heard that ring and I said cowbell. Sorry. Um, he had a fever for sharing the message of Jesus Christ to people. He just needed to do it. He was compelled by it, arrested by it, bound by this thing that called him to share God's grace with people. And, and I want to pick up in, in uh, let's pick up in Acts 20. Acts 20 um, 22 through 24 says, and this is Paul talking to the Ephesian church elders at the time. Um, and, and he says this, and see now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me. Nor do I count my, my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry for which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify. To testify to what? To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the grace of God. 
What's amazing is here, if you know Paul's history, he was actually a predator hunting down Christians early, the, you know, when they called themselves the way, the early church, he would, he would go into cities armed with a letter from the high priest in Jerusalem to, to arrest, and kill those who were walking out this, this outrageous faith, this outrageous claim that Jesus Christ is Lord, the one and only true way to heaven. And then what's amazing here as we, as we consider who Paul ends up being is that the pursuers become the pursued, the hunter, the hunted. That He is no longer carrying a letter of authority riding on a donkey to Damascus. Huh. He's walking in the authority of the Holy Spirit. And he says, look, I know stuff's going to go down. <laughs> Holy Spirit keeps telling me, guys, any day now I could be dead. I don't really care all about that. What I care about is the most important thing that I have going right now. It's this, it's this thing that binds me, this thing that, 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 that arrests me, some translations say. That drive me to share the grace of God, the, the gospel, the good news of the grace of God to all people. And, I, and, you know, sometimes I talk to people and they say, Pastor Randall, I have such a struggle reading the Bible. And quite frankly, that's why we're changing some of the stuff we do here as a church. Instead of just telling people, read your Bible, come to church, right? Give, love people, serve. We're going we're gonna to walk through what that really means. We're going to have classes. And, you know, what's your next step? Maybe it's learning how to read your Bible and digest and, and not just read it like a Grisham novel, but read it like the living word of God and hear the voice of God. Come on, Joe, right? Anyways, they tell me I have a hard time. And what I always tell them is, okay, well, how are you reading your Bible? What are you doing? Well, I start at the beginning, and I, 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 I kind of read until my eyes hurt, and I go to sleep and feel guilty because I fell asleep halfway through. And I said, that's not, you're not, wait, wait a minute, right? We need to, when we, when we read this word, we need, to, we need to enter it with such creativity, such passion, such vision. We have to give God our very best. And when I read the word of God, I, I picture Paul sitting here in the book of Acts, the, 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 the Acts of the Apostles, the early church, talking to these elders of the Ephesian church, this, this amazing church that's growing out of, out, of, out of hatred and bigotry and persecution. And, and they're sitting across the well-worn wooden table, and Paul sitting there probably scribbling thank you notes, right, to people that hosted him and, 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 and gave him rooming or whatever while he was there in Ephesian, with the Ephesians. Maybe his, his belongings are tied up in a knot in a small sack on the dirty, dusty floor, waiting, just waiting for the Holy Spirit prompting to, to bind him, to arrest him to go. And Paul was ready ready to go at any moment, to listen to God. To, he knows that that's what's important. He knows what that's important. And what their faces must have looked like as he scribbled out and said, listen, I got to go. I got to go. But Paul, listen, man, they, they hate you there. Stay with us. Pour into us. Let us send some, some other, some of our younger disciples, and let them go share. And Paul says, no, 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 that stuff doesn't bother me doesn't bother me at all. I, I, I actually consider it worth nothing. My life is nothing compared to this thing that compels me, that draws me to the people that God is calling me to love. People don't know. People don't know they're free. So I, I think about that, and I think about how Paul, what he must have been thinking. Well, you know, Paul, what are you going to teach? Like when you get there, are you, are you going to use the story of your own testimony? to talk about this amazing grace of God. Like, you know, are you gonna, are you gonna tell them that? Or you, maybe you t share some of the dis disciple stories of this healing the blind and the deaf and raising the dead and all these amazing things that Jesus did. And of course, we have no way of really knowing. But I like to think that he was a relational guy, right? That he taught along the lines of understanding and he, he related to be, he became the people that he was teaching to the point which he could communicate in a way that they could understand. So I, I think he probably would have picked one of the Old Testament stories, right? These, these great biblical texts that, that, that the Jews knew. So I, I, I want you to turn with me to the book of Hosea. I'm sure it's one of your dog-eared, most highlighted chapters of your Bible. <laughs>
See, Hosea was, was the last of the great prophets that God sent to the northern kingdom of Israel before they were destroyed by the Assyrians. And he presents a powerful story of God's love for his people who once had, had, again, had fallen into temptation and fallen away and turned away from God to enjoy the prosperity of this new land that they were in. With riches came moral and spiritual degradation. The list reads kind of as a familiar one, you know. They were dealing with the same stuff we deal with. Lust, lying, killing, stealing, adultery, drunkenness, perversion, perjury, deceit, all kinds of crazy stuff, oppression. But the thing that grieved God's heart the most wasn't, wasn't, wasn't that stuff, believe it or not, but it was the idolatry. It was the idolatry. The golden calf set up by Jeroboam about, about 150 years earlier had opened up the floodgates to every evil expression of the Canaanites, including drunkenness, religious prostitution, and even human sacrifice. Since the Lord viewed Israel as his wife, he viewed her worship of other gods as spiritual adultery. So God spoke through the prophet Hosea, whose name meant Jehovah is salvation. And what's crazy about these old prophets um, is that, that you know, we, we kind of tend to think that they were kind of rock stars, you know. Like they would say stuff and stuff would happen. God spoke directly to them. And that's an incredible thing. It's an incredible thing, especially when so few but them had access to the Holy Spirit at that time. I mean, it was, it was just, it was the priests and the prophets. And, 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 and God would take their lives and it would become a mirror to what he was teaching. So we see, we see Hosea and the very first thing, it, I, I, where's the scripture? Um, sorry. I, I find this fascinating. When the, when the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him. First thing God says to Hosea. Go take to yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of prostitution. For the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking the Lord. Huh. Wow. That's the first thing you're going to say to me, God? That's a real great call into missions field. I'll do it! You know, what? And, and you, it's crazy. And people, another thing people will talk to me, how do you know God's talking to you, Pastor? I pray, and I, I kind of feel like I've never, you know, is it auditory? Is it just an impression on your heart? What is that? How do you know that God's speaking to you? And, and, and honestly, if this, is, if this is how God spoke to me, I might not be too excited to listen. Randall, this is God speaking. Uh, Father, it is I, Randall, your servant. You are a shepherd to my people. People look to you to see me in some ways. God, I'm far from a reflection of you, but I do seek you with all my heart. Okay, Randall, then here's the plan. Go down to the brothel and marry a prostitute named Gomar, then have some kids who were born by a whore. Uh, Gomar? Whore? What? Right? Can you imagine? This is your call into ministry. Go marry a prostitute. Make some hoary kids. Huh? I mean, this is Bible. This is crazy, right? This is crazy. But, but like I said before, this is a reflection. Uh, Hosea and Gomar. Like, could, uh, uh, what a name, huh? Hey, baby. It's hard to write poetry for Gomar. Um, the reflection of their marriage, their relationship, is a reflection of God, the, the, the husband, and the bride, the church, his people, Israel. But for Hosea, this is what God was asking him to do. He wanted Hosea's life to be a living portrait of the relationship between God and his people. And this is what we see in all the early prophets. Now, we know that 
Gomar, and, and, and this, is, this is something that is kind of debatable uh, amongst theologians. Some are in the school of thought that maybe she hadn't started prostitution yet, but she was adulterous and she was getting around sort of a deal, but she wasn't necessarily selling herself for money. And others believe, well, it says harlot and prostitute. That's probably what she was. Um, but it doesn't really matter because we know that where we find Gomar is that she's broken. In either situation, she was already undervaluing herself, disvaluing herself, and, and giving herself away. She didn't have a perspective that honored who, in fact, she was. And we see Hosea. You know, we, can you imagine? Can you imagine what Hosea must have been thinking? The first thing God says to me is to go marry a prostitute. Now listen, if you're coming in for counseling with me, and you say, Pastor, I heard the voice of God. Great. I know you've been praying for that man. What's he revealing in your life? He wants me to go marry a prostitute and make whorish kids. I'm going to put you in with Pastor Frank. <laughs> say, Frank, this one needs it deep. They're not listening from God. They're listening to a personal fantasy or something. Weird, right? Thank God we live under the grace of Jesus and not this, this crazy prophet sort of a situation. I, but, but this is what he wanted for him. I mean, he, he had to be saying, like, really, God? I'm faithful to you. The first time I hear your voice, you're telling me to go desecrate myself? I, I want to share your word. I believe that I, I have pieces of you in me that need to be heard by your lost people, Lord. But then you're discrediting me. Who's going to listen to me? Married to a prostitute. And this is where we get it. Our first glimpse of grace. This is the first understanding of the depth of God's love, this wild, unrelenting, driving gospel that is impossible to comprehend on our terms. God tells us it's through the gospel of grace that you are free. Free from the works, from the world's definition, free from what others are trying to pin on you, free from ourselves and guilt and condemnation and status. Free! God says, don't worry about what other people are thinking. Listen to your father. Go down and get that girl. It was also God's grace that would ultimately save Gomer from a, from a life of pain and a loving relationship and into a loving relationship with a godly man. Now, the, the early days of their marriage must have been funky, right? But as their love began to blossom, Hosea's heart broke with love for Gomer. The scripture says that he loved her. She became his wife. God blessed their union with his son. How Hosea's heart must have swelled with joy. He was convinced that this marriage would be better than ever with this little one to brighten their home. It was after the birth of Jezreel that Hosea seems to have noticed a change in Gomer. She became a restless and unhappy. And as Gomer would go out and preach the word of God to a desperate nation, she would kind of linger at home. <sighs> bored, frustrated, antsy. This man of God would lavish love on her and just remind her how beautiful she was and that she could do no wrong in his eyes because God had given to him, to her to him as a gift. And yet Gomar continued to walk and get distracted and Maybe stay out later at night as Jose would lay in bed wrestling with God. God, where is she? Would you bring her home to me, Father? I know that you said what you said, but I thought because I love her so much, God. I thought that we would have a relationship of love and that, that I was meant to, to show your love to her, that she would be saved from all the things. that We find out later that that that. Omar's absences from home probably grew more and more frequently and prolonged. And then Hosea starting to feel pangs of suspicion about her faithfulness to him. Gomer got pregnant again. 
Hosea was convinced that, that this child was not his. At God's direction, he called her Lorahana, which means unloved. What a name. What a label. Implying that she would not enjoy her true father's love. No sooner had Lorahana been weaned from Gomer than she conceived again, and it was another boy. God told Hosea to call him Loami, which means no kin of mine. Brutal. It symbolized Israel's alienation from Jehovah, but it also exposed Gomer's cheating escapades. The child was born in Hosea's house, was not his own. While the entire second chapter of Hosea is is talking about Israel and it's it's pulling away from from God, pulling away from God and the brokenness in their situations and and God's pursuing love for them and his his reprimands and and his, his pleas and his warnings and his pursuit, it mirrors the relationship of Gomer and Hosea. You can't read it sandwiched between chapter 1 and chapter 3 and think, oh, this has nothing to do with the first part of the story. What's this good? You know, it, 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 it perfectly models. And, and what's crazy, hmm. what's crazy about this is that it's the story of God and his church and Gomer and Hosea. Let me read it to you. And, 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 and I'm just going to highlight some of this, this the, the verse 2, okay? He pleaded with her, 2-2. Two, two. He threatened to disinherit her, 2-3. But she ran off with her lovers because they promised to lavish material things on her. It's in 2-5. He tried to stop her on occasion, 2-6. But he continued to seek her, to seek companions in sin, 2-7. Hosea would take her back in loving forgiveness and they would try again. But her repentance would only be short-lived, and soon she would be off again with another new lover. And the final blow, maybe it was a note on the pillow, maybe somebody whispered in his ear after he got off the rock that he was preaching from. But the essence of it seems to have been, I'm leaving for good this time. I found my true love, and I'm never coming back. How Hosea must have suffered. He loved her so deeply, he, he grieved for her as though she had been murdered. His heart ached, and she, she, she chose a life that would surely bring her to ruin. His friends were probably saying, Hosea, wake up! Don't you see that God's trying to use you? You're a preacher, man. Let her go. Quit obsessing about her. She's a prostitute. That's all she's ever going to be, Hosea. Let her go. But Hosea, he still loves her. And, and, you know, this is the point in the HBO special where you're like, that's not believable. Nuh-uh, nuh-uh. Good actors, but you almost had me, but no. Who's going to do that? Girls on the street all broken up, men, 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 abuse, degradation, hurt, pain, some guy, some great man of God who has finances comes and sweeps her off her feet, takes her to a house, loves her, worships her, gives her his heart, gives her everything, gives her a beautiful child. She cheats on him. He pursues her, brings her back. She, rep- she cheats on him again. He keeps going after that sky. Come on. And at this point, at this point, I want to look at the Bible and say, hey, Gomer, Are you nuts? Everything you're looking for, girl, it's right there, and Hosea's arms are wide open. Where are you going? Turn around. I actually started, part of me wants to start, like, resenting Gomer, like, being, uh, hating her because of what she's doing to Hosea. This poor dude, all he ever wanted to do was serve God. All he wanted to do was be obedient to the Father. And she runs him through this mess again and again, breaking his heart, leaving with three kids, two of which aren't even his own. I mean, come on, Gomer. When I begin to realize and what I, what I come up against every, every, so many times in Scripture, so many times in Scripture, when I want to be angry, when I want to hate, when I want to say, you idiots, I realize that I am Gomer. 
Certainly not Hosea. <laughs> Certainly not him. And I know I'm standing before you and I wear this title as a pastor, but I am far from perfect. And I find myself way too often bumping up against the same wall that has been troubling me for years. And I think if we're honest, we start to understand that we're all Gomer. We're all this, this broken vessel, like in that song, pieced together by God's grace. And so many of us will come in here into this place, and we're coming from a place of brokenness and a place of hurt and a place of, of disappointment. And we find church, and we, we discover the love of Jesus Christ, and we stand down here, and we raise our hands, and tears pour down our cheeks as we worship this God who loves us. And then we start picking at the surface after a couple months to find blemish. Start picking, a pieces, part, picking pieces apart of, of, I don't know, what kind of worship music is they're playing. Or, or I don't know if I like that carpet out there. And we, and we, and we, and we, and we fall away. We give in. We, we become Gomer. We, we start getting bored. Huh. I know a lot of stuff's good going on there, but I don't see any in my life. Shoot. We're looking for other places to be fed. We're looking for something else. And, and sometimes the new ones, we, you know, we'll come in here and we'll get all this. And then all of a sudden we don't know, uh, you know, what, it seems to be going really good for them over there, but I'm not getting that. And well, I'm just going to skip this Sunday. I don't feel good. And then the next Sunday doesn't feel good either. I know I have stuff going on in my life. And then all of a sudden, what happens? We start pulling away. And we start, we start pushing away what we know was helpful, the salvation that came. And we start walking back to what we used to know, this familiar place of lust, of sin, of the things that are going to threaten to take us down. And we can get all really angry at Gomer. We can, we can get mad at the people of Israel. How dare they, you know, wallow in their prosperity and, and sin against God? Don't they see that the blessings all come from him? Well, take a look at our newspapers. I mean, what was Gomer to do, too? She knows she had disappointed and deceived and lied and ran back and forth. Was she supposed to beg now, now that Hosea come back again? I'm ready now. I learned my lesson. What we find out is that Jesus is pursuing us even in the depth of our betrayal. He rushes into the darkness rushes into the darkest areas of our lives to the most hidden areas of our hearts and leads us back home. He just wants us back home. We look at the scripture and we see that God spoke to, to, to Hosea, and this is in Hosea 3.1. Go again. Go again. Go, go again. Love a woman. Love a woman who is loved by her husband, yet an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods. Even though she continued to betray his love, God wanted him to seek her out and prove his love to her. Whew. How could anybody love that deeply? The answer was right there in the instruction to Hosea, even as the Lord loved. Even as the Lord loves. Only one who knows the love and forgiveness of God can ever love this perfectly. And the only one who has experienced this love, this loving forgiveness, well, we can't help but love and forgive others. So he began his search, driven by that indestructible divine love, the love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love that never ends. And he found her. Ragged, torn, sick, dirty, disheveled, destitute, chained to an auction block and some filthy, stinking sex slave market. A repulsive shadow of the woman that he once knew. Hosea bought her from her slavery. 
for 15 shekels of silver and 13 bales of hay or barley. Probably the rest of his savings. And what, what I love, if you notice, he doesn't show up. He doesn't show up screaming, where's that dirty woman? Where's that prostitute that dares consider herself my wife? Get your dirty butt in the car, girl. We're going home. Right? We see, and, and, and that might sound funny, but, but, but after a good worship experience, you can hear that same conversation in the parking lot outside of our church. And I'm not being judgmental, guys. Look, I preach to myself more than I preach to you. I promise. I promise. But he didn't pursue her like that. He didn't condemn her. He didn't shout her down. He didn't embarrass her further. He didn't run her through her muck. He, he, he pursued her with love. Huh. And this is what grace looks like. This is what Jesus looks like. He woos her home. He loves her back into the promises of his love and dreams for her. He says, in your worst, I will love you with my very, very best. And when you're in the deepest of your rebellion, there is no hope or way out. I will open the door of hope to you. Ooh, I just felt Holy Spirit come in the room when I said that. God is opening a door of hope for some of you people in here today. God is opening the door of hope. When you have no voice and you find yourself trapped in darkness, I will bring you to a safe place and a peaceful place where you can sing freely like a child without fear. Hosea 2, 15 through 20 says this. There I will give back her vineyards to her and transform her valley of troubles into a door of hope, a door of hope. He's going to transform her brokenness. She will respond with me there, singing with joy as in the days long ago in her youth. And after I have freed her from captivity in, my, in, in Egypt, in that coming day, says the Lord, she will call me my husband instead of my master. God is longing for a relationship with you. He's not a slave owner. He's a chain breaker. And I will cause you to forget your idols, and their names will not be spoken anymore. And at that time, I will make a treaty between you and the wild animals, the birds, the snakes, not to fear each other anymore. You don't got anything to worry about. The very hands that sculpted you sculpted everything else, and I put you on top. You got, you got somebody on your side, girl. You got somebody on your side. You don't need to fear each other anymore either. And I'll destroy all weapons and all wars will end. And then you will lie down in peace and safely. Unafraid. And I will bind you to me forever with chains of righteousness and justice and love and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and love. And you will really know me as you never have before. Ooh, I tell you what, I believe that some of you are going to know Jesus the way you never have before. I believe that some of us are walking around like we're chained to the slave block. Lying on our muck, lying in our sadness, lying in our, 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 our insecurities, our fears, our worry. God says, listen, God says you don't have to do that anymore. Jesus hung on the cross and he said, what? It's finished. He didn't say to be continued. He said, I'm done. You're done. And if you embrace me, then you can walk free. We don't follow Jesus to get out of hell. We follow him to walk in righteousness and freedom to do the very purposes that he has called us to accomplish. Guys, we don't know what it looks like, though, to be free. Do you know that you can wake up every morning Free from condemnation. For there is therefore no now, now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. 
right? We don't live by the law of the flesh, but the law of the flesh is death. The law of the spirit. Come on. Come on. We walk in the power and the, of the Holy Spirit. We walk in life. We walk in freedom. We walk around sometimes with our head between our knees. And Jesus is saying, what are you doing that for? Goofy kid, just say you're sorry. Let's get on with our business. I'm not saying you're not going to sin anymore, but I'm saying you're free from sin. And that's a weird concept. Maybe that's hard to understand. But I'm saying is that when you are born again in Jesus Christ, you are a new creation. You're no longer uh, 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 held captive by the flesh. Yeah, we still will slide. We'll still make mistakes. But Jesus says, you don't have to pay the penalty for that. You just got to repent. And you need to step forward and love me because I don't want to waste time. You got stuff to do. Tired of talking to Christians who are bored. Time to talk to, I'm, I'm trying to talk to people about this life with Jesus and they're complaining about stuff. The Holy Spirit doesn't move here anymore. I don't see God working in this. Well, pardon me. What are you seeing? Because I'm seeing it all over the place. Tell me about your life. Tell me about your life. Are you out telling people the gospel of grace? Are you sharing with people about Jesus? Are you laying hands on the sick? Are you seeing people that are healed? Are you seeing people walk up out of, out of wheelchairs? Are you doing what Christ has enabled you to do? Because if you are doing it, then you have no excuse to be bored because this life is an adventure. It's a problem is, is we have a perspective problem. We were blind, but now we see. It's his amazing grace, right? Sometimes we as believers, sometimes we as believers are blind to what the promises in Christ are. The world tells us we're one thing, and we believe that, we wear that before we wear what God has called us. What is the sense in that? What is the sense in that? When we can be free, when you can wake up every morning and say, you know what? No condemnation. I don't care what people put on me because I know I'm a woman of God or a man of God. That's right. If he's for me, then who can be against me? And you can judge me, but I'm just going to love you. Not because I, I, I'm so good, but because he loved me first. And you see, when he loves me, <laughs> I'm filled with him. So I got to love you. And I'm going to love you so much that when I go to the grocery store, I'm going to quit trying to get the closest parking sign and cut in line and, and try to work my way and grab stuff. I'm going, to, I'm going to pray before I enter that space. And I'm going to say, Jesus, claim me for this day, right now. God, I want to walk in your power and authority. I am free. And free indeed. So if there's somebody in the bread aisle that needs praying for, let it be me. If I need to witness to my cashier, if I need to pay for somebody else's groceries, let it be me, Father. I want to know that I am in your purpose. You want to talk about a boring Christian life? Try to live in like Jesus. And then come back to me. It's about time we take responsibility, y'all. It's 2018. We're going to let another year go by in captivity? Or are you going to agree with Jesus when he says you're free? <laughs> Are you going to agree with Jesus when he says, I have a plan for you? Are you going to agree with God who says, all things that I have accomplished can be done through you and even greater such things? Listen, he wants to use you to radically transform the people under your influence. Be free. It's already done. If you've accepted Jesus Christ, you're free. Yet we wallow around in our sadness and our depression and our broken relationships. It's Jesus said, give that to me. Give that to me. I didn't lay on that cross because, because I was worried that I wasn't going to be able to forgive you for cheating on your homework. I laid on the cross for the hard stuff. Give it to me. No wonder you're struggling. You don't trust me. We got to know who we are. We got to know who we are, even when, especially when the stuff is hitting the fan, right? Because we, 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 we need Jesus. Man, it's, it's, it's easy to, to say that the Holy Spirit is our comforter. But if you never need comfort, no wonder you're not experiencing him. 
You need to get in some, 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 some uncomfortable situations for Holy Spirit to show up and be Holy Spirit. And I'm challenging this year, let 2018 be the year of, defi- of definition. It's the year of definition. I am no longer me, but I am free. And I am free indeed. I believe if we got this understanding of this gospel of grace, this thing that bound Paul, compelled him, arrested him to go, if we understood it, just even a little bit, half of us understood it, we wouldn't have room in this place but to stand. Enough is enough. We got empty seats. This is the best church. I mean, listen, I'm not, I'm not comparing us to other churches. I guess I just did. Forgive me, Father. But I don't feel condemned because I'm free. I love my home. I know that any person I invite in here was going to be treated with dignity. They're going to encounter a real God and, a, and, and excellence and the worship and the word. And it's not going to be some man, manufactured feel-good thing, but it's going to be the unapologetic word of God because my pastor is a pastor who takes this seriously. And we're expecting your guests, and we're going to love them. So let's get busy, guys. Let's make a resolution this year to be free. Can you do that with me?